uh, the Oncology Academic Forum for inviting me for this lecture. Uh, so in the next 45 minutes to one hour, we will discuss about the various cervical lymph node stations and its clinical importance, radiological boundaries, and how we, to, how we need to incorporate this into our daily clinical practice. We all know that there are one third of the head, lymph nodes in our body is in head and aphasia. And the lymphadenopathy can be either due to infection, inflammation, or it may be due to malignant. So we will discuss only about the malignant part. So we know that there is a surgical classification and there is a radiological classification for cervical lymph nodes. And the surgical classification is divided into level one, is divided into level 1A and 1B. So the level 1A and 1B will be the 1A is the submental lymph nodes. 1B is the submandibular nodes, and this is called the submental submandibular group, that is the nodal group. Then you have the level 2, that is the high deep cervical chain lymph nodes. Then there's a mid deep, mid, mid deep cervical nodes, that's a level 3, and you have the low, deep, lower deep cervical. And they are, they are level 2, level 3, and level 4 nodes. You have the level 5 nodes, that is called the, that is called the posterior cervical lymph nodes. And you have level six, that is the anterior jugular. You have the levels anterior jugular, pre laryngeal, pre tracheal, and paratracheal lymph nodes. So, this is this level six lymph nodes. And when you have a malignancy in a, a nodes arising from a oral cavity, either it can be a level 1A, 1B, or level 2 lymph nodes are usually involved in from an oral cavity. The level one is divided in level 1A. That's mainly drains the anterior aspect of the oral cavity. Level 1B, mainly the oral cavity, the paranasal sinuses, and also the external auditory canal. The level 2 mainly drains the oropharynx, nasopharynx, the hypopharynx, larynx. Level 3 mainly drains, uh, level 3 mainly drains the hypopharynx lymph nodes. If, if you have an isolated level 3 lymph nodes, then you have to think about a primary in the in the pyriform sinus or a posterior pharyngeal wall or the post cricoid because level three is, is a level three mainly trains from the hyperpharynx. Then level you have the level four nodes, you have level four A node and level four B is there. Level four A is any tumor who have a subglottic extension, transglottic tumors, or subglottic primaries, thyroid malignancies, then post cricoid, cervical esophagus, this all can train into six level four lymph nodes. When you have lower level four lymph nodes, you need to consider the primaries in the thorax as well. Level five lymph nodes is, is level 5A and 5B. We will discuss all these classifications later in, in the due course lecture. Level five is usually unique for one, carcinoma nasopharynx. Second is, is the non-Hodgkin's lymph form. So usually these are the two classic of uh, posterior cervical lymph nodes. So when you have a level five lymph node, you have to think more of these two possibilities, although you can have, uh, if you have a level two and level three bulky nodes from oropharynx or hyperpharynx, then you can have level five lymphadenopathy. But in general, it is either a CNA pharynx or a diffuse law if it's a non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Level two is divided level two A and two B, and surgically it is by the spinal accessory nerve, and radiologically it is by the internal jugular vein. Level three, thank God, there is no subclassification. 6 is divided into 6A and 6B. We will discuss that if time permits. Okay, so this is how the, there is a difference between surgical classification and radiological classification. And those who are interested, I'm sure all, I urge all the residents to read this paper by the Green, Vincent Gregoire, published in Green Journal in 2003. That was the, the radiological classification of cervical lymph nodes. And in our discussion today, we will be discussing mainly level two, level three, level four, level five, and rutopharyngeal lymph nodes. If time permits, we will discuss level one B, one A, six A, six B lymph nodes. But I'm not sure, level seven B, that's retrostyle. We may not be able to finish the whole business in one hour. But I will try to finish at least this five regions in detail today. And we will have another class if, if uh, there is, if, if you are interested. And first we will take, we will be discussing few play case scenarios, then how to approach that particular problem. Here we have a 15 year old gentleman who is a smoker and alcoholic, presents with bilateral level two lymph nodes. So this, I want to draw attention of each one of every, this is the, this is the hyoid bone. And between, this is the anterior belly of the digastric, and this is the posterior belly of the digastric. 
And between the two belly of the anterior belly, of the, this is the anterior belly on other one side or other side. So between these two belly, anterior belly of the digastric, this forms the one element. And between the two belly of the digastric, this is the anterior belly of the digastric and this is posterior belly of the digastric. The posterior belly of the digastric is inserted into the mastoid process. And between the two bellies, you have, and this is the mandible. So this is a, this is a triangle that is called a submandibular triangle between two belly of the digastric and submandibular gland. This is the submandibular region that is a one pill and the region from the c1 vertebra to the level of the hyoid bone and this is the level two region this is the level two region and the caudal limit of 1a 1p and level two is the caudal edge of the hyoid bone so all the 1a 1b and the level two the caudal edge is formed by the inferior limit is formed by the caudal edge of the hyoid bone so this is how, so the patient is having a level two lymphadenopathy. Whenever you have a smoker and alcohol, you have to think more in favor of a, head, a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. So whenever you have any cervical lymph, lymphadenopathy, these are the features which we need to consider before in the history and clinical examination, before embarking on a clinical diagnosis. One age of the patient. If the patient is elderly, if the patient is elderly and patient is habits, habits, then you think more of a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. Suppose if you have a pediatric age group, if a, say, a boy or a girl less than 10 years, you think more of an acute lymphatic leukemia. If you have an adolescent male, say, between 10 and 20 years, then if you have a cervical lymphadenopathy, then you have to think about, one, the patient may have a Hodgkin's disease, number one. The patient can have a carcinoma nasopharynx, And third, the patient can have a high-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma like lymphoblastic lymphoma. So this is how you need to know the age of the patient. The second is uh, the, uh, as the, uh, you know that as the age advances, the grade of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma comes down. The pediatric age group in the adolescent, you have a high grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The young adults, you have the intermediate grade or a diffuse last basal lymphoma. Then in the elderly people, you have the mainly the low grade lymphoma, follicular lymphoma grade one or grade two. So this is how, the, as the age is important, when you're dealing with squamous cell carcinoma, lymphoma, or you have leukemia, you have a second peak of leukemia that's around 60 years. Suppose a patient who is having a short history of lymphadenopathy, bleeding manifestations, or patient is looking sick, infection, then you think more of an adult ALL. And the Hodgkin's lymphoma have two peaks between 10 and 20 and 50 and 59. Same is applicable for carcinoma and asopharynx also. And both these diseases have two peaks. This is age of the patient. Performance status is very important for any malignant problem because this determines, this is one of the factors which determines the prognosis and also the compliance to the subsequent treatment. Now, when you have a generalized lymphadenopathy, you more think more of, say, lymphoma, bar leukemia, or symptoms if it is confined to the neck, it may be, it may be a squamous cell carcinoma or it may be a lymphoma. Then you have to look and ask for history, suggest if any tumor in the head and neck side, say, like. If you have a nasal symptoms or patient is having, say, uh, nasal symptoms or patient is having ear symptoms, cranial or palsy, you think more of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Foreign body sensation, throat pain, nodinophagia, it may be due to a oropharyngeal primer. If the patient is having hoarseness, it may be due to a CL larynx. If it is a patient is having lower cervical nodes and patient is having hoarseness, you have to think about carcinoma lung, especially if the patient is having clubbing. Or if the, it can also be due to see a thyroid. Then if the female with multiple levels of lymph nodes and patient is having closeness, then you have to think about carcinoma thyroid. That's how you need to know the symptoms suggestive of any primary. If a patient is having dysphagia, it may be due to hyperpharynx or a cervical esophagus. The habits, this is very important. Most of these patients with uh, the uh, squamous cell carcinoma will have history of smoking, alcoholism, or both. Visceral involvement is more it can occur in Hodgkin's lymphoma or, and also in non-Hodgkin's, more in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. These symptoms can occur in both Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is how you have to take. If and in the history examination, if it is more of a hard consist consistency, then you have to think about more of a palm cell carcinoma. If, you have a, if a patient is having soft or rubbery, then you think more of a lymphoma. It can also occur in P16 positive carcinoma or 
So the the if you discuss, you can see that leukemia is a lymphoma can occur at any at any any region, in any subsite. You can have in the cervical nodal region in any site. Mainly, if you have a level two or level three, you think more of head and neck primary because if you have a level two, level three, you think more of nasopharynx, oropharynx, larynx, or hypopharynx primary. If you have lower cervical nodes, like level four nodes, or a patient is having supraclavicular leukocele nodes, then you have to think more of primary from down, either from breast, lung, GIT, or GU. And that is how you have to think about. Suppose a patient is a 20 year old male presenting with a left supraclavicular leukocele node, then you to think more of a testicular germ cell. If a patient who is uh, having a 50 year old female patient presents with a left supraclavicular leukocele node or a right supraclavicular leukocele node, you think more of a carcinoma of breast or CLR or C esophagus for that matter. Left ACF node in a female, always you have to rule out a carcinoma cervix also. And any left ACF node in a female, in elderly female, you have to, I think you do, a, you have to do a breast examination and also you should do a PV and PR to rule out any lesion in the cervix. And GIT, we all know that's pharmacy carcinoma, uh, sorry, left ACF node, adenocarcinoma from stomach, pancreas, rectum, or any side left ACF node can be involved. Then uh, in males, you should not forget about prostate. The left ACF node and a male, elderly male, you should not forget about prostate cancer. Now for this patient, the patient had a level two node and the patient is a smoker and alcoholic. Probable sites we have discussed, it is level, it's the nasopharynx, it can be oropharynx, larynx, hypopharynx. Nasopharynx is down in the list because the patient is a smoker and alcoholic. And always you should also understand that the posterior part of the anterior two thirds of the tongue also drains directly into level two lymph nodes. So the patient can have an primary in the anterior two thirds of the tongue also in the posterior aspect. And uh, not, not basically, it may not be a base of tongue or a posterior one third lesion. And another important thing, you do not come across, you do not come across usually gingivocal complex tumors directly training in the lymph node without involvement of the one lymph node. So these are the probable primary sites. Uh, see oropharynx, larynx, hypopharynx, nasopharynx, second peak, posterior one third of the uh, posterior aspect of the anterior two third of the tongue. Also this 50% of the diffuse large basal lymphoma can occur below before 60 years. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, usually an intermediate state. That second Hodgkin's lymphoma, second peak, adult ALL, and most probably the low-grade MHL usually occurs after 60 years. Usually they will have waxing and waning of symptoms, slow progression of the lymph nodes, slow enlargement. Then uh, uh, mainly the posterior cervical nodes, patient can have infraclavicular node, brachial group, then popliteal. All these uh, unusual sites usually occurs in low-grade MHL. And they generally present at stage three and stage four, they can have visceral involvement and hepatosplenemic megaly. This we have discussed. Now coming to the, the limits of uh, level two lymphadenopathy. Where should be the cranial limit? Where should be the caudal limit? And uh, you know that uh, in surgically, in, in the surgically, the level two lymph nodes involves say, the, at the level of the insertion of the posterior belly of the digaster. So this is the, uh, this is the posterior belly of the digastric. So at the, at the insertion of the mastoid, that is the incision, at the, at the insertion of the mastoid, that is surgical cranial limit of level two. But radiologically, it is slightly different. When they evaluated the neck dissection specimens, it was found that the superior nodal level, the clips were clustered around the caudal border of the transverse cross of the C1 vertebra. So the cranial limit of level two is decided as the caudal edge of the caudal border of the transverse cross of C1 vertebra. So this is the, the cranial limit of level two. And the caudal limit of level two is the caudal edge of the hyoid bone, the caudal edge of the body of the hyoid bone. So this is the last cut of the hyoid bone. The superior limit is at the caudal, is, is at the caudal edge of the, uh, is at the caudal edge of the caudal border of the transverse cross of C1 vertebra. And the caudal limit is the caudal edge of the body of the hyoid bone. That's the superior and inferior extent. So this is the last cut of the hyoid bone. This is epiglottis. This is the pre-epiglottic space, continuing laterally as the paraglottic fat. This is the array epiglottic fold. And array epiglottic is continuing posteriorly as the pyriform fossa. This is the pyriform fossa. And this is the posterior pharyngeal wall. 
And so this is at the level of the hyoid bone. So this is at the caudal edge of the hyoid bone. I have already told you that the caudal edge of the hyoid bone is, is corresponding to the, the caudal edge of 1A, 1B, and level 2, all the caudal edge. And this also forms the cranial limits of the level 6. The level 6 is continuing as the anterior groove. The cranial limit is the caudal edge of the hyoid bone. That's the cranial limit of the level 6. It extends from the caudal edge of the hyoid bone to the sternum. Why I'm saying? Because we may not be able to discuss the anterior group today. And when we discuss the other limits, the anterior limit and posterior limit, so you have discussed the superior and the inferior limit. The anterior limit is the, this is the posterior, this is the submandibular gland. The posterior extent of the submandibular gland is the anterior limit of the level 2 lumbar bone. And the medial limit is, this is the, this is the hyoid bone, this is the internal carotid artery, this is the this is the internal jugular vein. This is the area where we are discussing. So the medial, this is anterior. This is the medial limit. This is the medial limit. It is formed by the medial edge of the internal carotid artery. This is the medial edge of the internal carotid artery. Uh, can you see that? Where, whether my pointer is working? Yes. Sir. Can, yes, you can see that. Okay, thank you very much. So this is the internal, this is the medial edge of the internal carotid artery. And this is, in, this is what you see in radiologically. And this is the scalenous muscle. This is scalenous muscle is anterior, middle, and posterior is there. I will show you in a better picture. This is not very clear. So the medial limit is formed by the medial edge of the internal carotid artery and the scalenous muscle. And the posterior limit. The posterior limit is formed by the posterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the sternocleidomastoid. The anterior limit is formed by the the is the posterior limit of the submandibular gland. And here, the posterior limit is formed by the posterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. The lateral limit is formed by various structures. One is the medial edge of the sternocleidomastoid. And others are posterior belly of the digastric, parotid gland, and platysma. I will show you in the subsequent pictures. In this picture, you can see this is the level 2 lump node. This is the posterior belly of the digastric. Can you make out this? The medial edge of the posterior belly of the digastric forms the lateral edge of the level 2 lymphadenopathy. The, the medial edge is formed by the medial edge of the internal carotid artery and scalenous muscle. Okay, this is the posterior, this is medial, and this is the anterior scalenous muscle. The posterior limit of the level 2 is formed by the posterior edge of sternocleidomastoid. The lateral limit is formed by the medial edge of the sternocleidomastoid. The medial edge of the the medial edge of the posterior belly of the digastric, and also you can see the parotid gland. Parotid gland also forms a uh, boundary of the lateral limit of the level two lymph node. Lymph node. Also, platysma forms that I will show you in the next another picture. So the level two is divided in level two a and two b. Surgically, it is formed by the spinal accessory nerve. Usually, we need to understand that the the nodes training from an oral cavity to a level 2B nodes are very, very, very low. The percentage of patients, percentage of lymphatic training from an oral cavity to level 2B nodes are very low. And if you have a level 2B node from an oral cavity, they have a bad prognosis. And level 2B nodes generally drains from mesopharynx or oral pharynx. And uh, this is about, uh, this is a uh, Radiologically, how you find out is the posterior limit of the internal tubular vein. Node straining anterior to the posterior limit of the level two. This is how it will look like in the body. This is spinal, spinal accessory now. This is the internal jugular vein. You cannot make out the spinal accessory now in a CT or MR. So you trust the internal jugular vein. Any nodes posterior to the, the internal jugular vein, that's how you see in CT. That is the level 2B. And nodes that trains anterior to the internal jugular vein, the posterior limit of the internal jugular vein, that is the level 2 level. And how, why you need a level 2A and 2B is again a matter of discussion in the radiological, in the oncology forums. Okay, so coming to the limits, uh, the superior limit is formed by this, the caudal limit of the C1 vertebra, and the, the caudal limit is formed by the, the caudal limit of the hyoid bone. This is a hyoid bone. Anteriorly, it is the posterior edge of the submandibular gland. Posteriorly, it is the posterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. And the medially, it is formed by the internal carotid artery and scalenous muscle. Laterally, it is bounded by the medial edge of the sternocleidomastoid. 
and other structures which I have mentioned in the past. This we have discussed, I am not going into the details. So coming back to the case we discussed, you need to consider all these possibilities. So if you, if you, if you have to do a nasal endoscopy to rule out clinical examination, always, it is, I want to emphasize this point, whenever you have a chronic smoker and alcohol, and patients having bilateral notes, always you should palpate the posterior one third of the tongue. It may be a primary in the posterior one third of the tongue. So you palpate the posterior aspect of the tongue. That is one of the important. Then others, other sites like soft palate, tonsil, patient can have carcinoma nasopharynx. Uh, uh, um, can you hear me? Because uh, someone has messaged me that there is no sound. You are audible? Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, can you mute, please? Okay. Uh, now, can you? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, the other areas uh, that is level two, level two region. Uh, uh, then uh, the sites we have discussed already. Another case: uh, the sixty-one-year-old gentleman presents with again a smoker and alcoholic. Here, I told you that. The posterior one third of the tongue is one of the area we always need to search if you have a bilateral nodes from a squamosal carcinoma. This patient had a T2 base of tongue with bilateral nodes. So it is a T2 N2C bilateral nodes. So composite stage is stage four disease. So the standard treatment is to go for concurrent chemo radiation. If this patient had a P16 positive, suppose if the patient is a young patient, no habits, and this is a T2. T2 is same in P16 positive or negative, but no subclassification for N2 in P16 positive carcinoma oropharynx. If bilateral nodes are there, it is considered it is it is considered stage two, that is N2, and so then it is considered stage two. So if a patient is having N1 and it is T2, it becomes multiple nodes on one side. Suppose if this node was not there, I will ha I have another case, then it becomes T1, T2, N1. That's the stage one disease. But patient having a bilateral nodes, then it becomes an N2 disease and it becomes a stage two. There is no subclassification like N2A, N2B or N2C in P16 positive carcinoma oropharynx and also in carcinoma nasopharynx. This is another case, a 59 year old gentleman who is a smoker and alcoholic, you can see another enhancing lesion in the left uh, uh, lateral uh, pharyngeal wall and uh, involving the palatoglose and palatopharynges and you can see nodes uh, in level two, this is the submandibular gland, and posterior to submandibular gland, you can see a node, another node, it is, uh, you can see underneath the sternocleidum astroid. So this is two nodes, ipsilateral nodes, and one side, and then multiple nodes, it becomes an N2P disease, it's a T2 primary, so it becomes a T2, N2P, stage 4A, standard treatment is concurrent radiation. If this patient is, a P16 positive, that is HPV positive, then it becomes T2. Multiple nodes on one side, it becomes N1. Then it becomes a stage one disease, stage one disease. In treatment, there is no difference because de intensification strategies have not proved to be of benefit as of now in P16 positive C oropharynx. And the clinical trials are underway in various strategies to reduce the morbidity. Now, this is another patient who is uh, again patient with base of tongue, you can see a well-defined enhancing, homogeneously enhancing lesion with node. So this is a P16 positive tumor. So most of them are intensely, and the P16 positive tumors are more intensely enhancing, more homogeneous, and more defined compared to the heterogeneously enhancing tumor, ill-defined tumors that is occurs in P16 negative slow. So this is again, this is a T2 N1, this is a T2 N1 stage one, but if it is P16 negative, that is the more common theoropharyngeal lesion, it becomes a stage three disease. And both are treated by chemo radiation. Now coming to the, one of the important factors which we discussed is aged patient. Suppose a patient with 20 year old male, persons with multiple level two and level three regions, then what are the, what are the possibilities you have to think of? One, it may be CNA cephalic. Number two, it may be a Hodgkin's disease. Third is a high grade non Hodgkin's lymphoma. If it is a lower down node, then you have to think about the testicular density. And here, you have to ask for any, any history suggestive of carcinoma nasopharynx. And Hodgkin's disease patient, you have to examine whether the patient is having a generalized lymphoma. 
or whether the patient is having uh, only nodes confined to neck, hepatosplenia megalia, B symptom. And uh, that is how you high grade NHL usually have a short history. Patient is having low, high grade count, counts, high counts, hepatosplenia megalia, maybe a mediastinal widening. And this most probably this may be a electroblastic lymphoma. So this is, uh, these are the possible. So if a patient is having say nasopharyngeal symptoms, then you have to do a nasal endoscopy and a biopsy. If a patient is having Hodgkin's disease, then you have to do an excision biopsy. If you are suspecting, then uh, so this is how you need to investigate that patient. So this was a case, a uh, 20 year old male, the uh, 20 year old male present with bilateral nodes, and patient is having nasal discharge. Now also patient is having difficulty in offering the mouth. This is another clinical situation. So the patient had this is the caudal edge of the higher bone. So this is the lower limit of the higher bone. So this is at the level, caudal limit of the level two or the cranial limit of level three. You have multiple nodes here and you have a lesion. Can you make out a lesion there? So this is a lesion in the nasopharyngeal region on the left side. And you, the lesion is involving the, the nasopharynx. The parapharyngeal space, you can make out the parapharyngeal space here. You cannot make out the obliteration of the parapharyngeal space. The prevertebral muscles and the involvement of the medial pterygoid muscles. Because of three factors, it becomes a T2 disease and bilateral nodes are there. So it becomes N2 disease. Any mul multiple nodes, bilateral nodes, bilateral nodes, and patient is not having any nodes below the caudal edge of the tricot cartilage or the nodes are not above the size of six centimeters. None of them are more than six centimeters. That becomes an N2 disease. N2 disease in carcinoma nasopharynx automatically becomes a stage 3 disease. N2 disease in P16 positive CN nasopharynx is stage 2 disease. N2 disease in squamous cell carcinoma of head and neck, like oral cavity, larynx, and hypopharynx is stage 4 disease. So this is a stage 3 disease. And the standard treatment is to go for chemoradiation. OK. Uh, Recently, there is data for induction chemotherapy. For an N2 disease, it may be chemo induction followed by chemo radiation. Induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation. And another possibility that I have mentioned is Hodgkin's disease. And this patient had Hodgkin's 20 year old male. The patient had Hodgkin's disease. And the, this is a favorable stage uh, 2 disease. Favorable stage 2, it is treated by the, the uh, ABBD plus uh, involved field radiation based on the HT10 protocol. So this patient was treated by two cycles of ABBD plus two and involved field radiotherapy, 20 green, 10 fractions. And uh, this is uh, and another patient, 59 year old male, multiple nodes involving level two and as well as level five nodes. You can see this is the Chenocleta master. You can see posterior cervical nodes. I told you in the beginning, when a patient is having a posterior cervical nodes, always you have to think about the non Hodgkin's lymphoma also. This was a diffuse last piece of lymphoma and this is a stage one disease. And stage one diffuse lap B cell lymphoma was treated by three cycles of ARCHO plus involved field radiotherapy, 30 green, 15 fractions, based on the SOC protocol. So, how you clinically distinguish between a Hodgkin's disease and non Hodgkin's lymphoma? Mainly, the Hodgkin's disease occurs in the peak, two peaks. Okay, one. Number two, it is usually contiguous. Second, it is centripetal. And extranodal involvement is rare, central, central nerve system involvement is rare. Visceral involvement is less compared to non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non Hodgkin's lymphoma can occur at any age group and it is usually non contiguous. Extranodal involvement is common, it is usually centrifugal. Visceral involvement can occur, hepatosplenum megaly and bone. Visceral involvement can occur in Hodgkin also, but it is less. Thinness involvement can occur in non Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know that the primary CNS lymphoma, all the testicular. Uh, Testicular non Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially diffuse lap based lymphoma involving testis, all age related malignancies, especially and also diffuse lap based lymphoma involving paranasal sinuses, all high grade histologies like lymphoblastic and buckets, they are all prone for CNS involvement. All these patients should have a CSC evaluation as part of workup. And it can occur at any age group. That's non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, a middle aged man presents with cystic nodes. You have a tumor in the base of skull, sorry, base of tongue, extending into pallicular, also cystic lump nodes, and in the level two region. This is the tumor, primary tumor. You have to think about, a, this is called the P16 positive carcinoma oropharynx. Most of them, it occurs, the small primary, large nodes, cystic nodes, 
and most of them may not have history of smoking or alcoholism. Middle East man presenting with no history of habits, presenting with small primary, large nodes, large cystic nodes, and poorly differentiated, basal or poorly differentiated histology with basal or features is characteristic of a P16 positive carcinoma nasopharynx, sorry, oropharynx. So all these patients should have a P16 assay, and this has to be staged accordingly. Although there is no difference in treatment, prognosis it is different. So the field cancerization is is not there in P16 positive, and there is a the oropharynx is the most common site. If you have, there is no need to do a P16 assay for oral cavity, larynx, or hypopharynx. It is applicable only for oropharyngeal carcinoma. And P53 mutations, the P53 is intact in HPV positive oropharyngeal carcinoma, or the P53 mutations are infrequent. Means this is one of the a, one of the factors which determines the radio sensitivity of the P16 positive C oropharynx. Although other factors are high lymphocyte rich, uh, uh, many other factors have been uh, postulated. These P53 mutations are infrequent, or it is intact. So apoptosis pathway, apoptotic pathway is intact. Another clinical scenario is 58-year-old gentleman uh, presents with uh, a not a smoker and alcoholic. So, and patient presents with tosis, tosis and difficulty of the left eye movements. And patient had level two lymphadenopathy. So whenever you have tosis and eye movements and left level two lymphadenopathy, this is a picture suggestive of an advanced carcinoma nasopharynx. And when we evaluate the patient, patient had proptosis. Can you see that this patient is having a proptosis? And there was an enhancing lesion in nasopharynx, which involvement, and it is involving the three, three, four, six cranial cranials, and involving the cavernous sinus, closely abutting the brainstem, and also involving the orbit. So this patient is having a T4 disease by virtue of the orbit involvement, intracranial extension, and also patient had cranial impulses. 20% of carcinoma nasopharynx can present with cranial nerve palsy at presentation. And the patient had level two lymphadenopathy. So this patient had a T4 N1 disease, and this is stage four a disease. So this patient should be treated with induction chemo followed by chemo radiation. And this patient should not be treated with palliation. The intention of treatment is cure to achieve a good locurial control and rather than palliation. All patients should be given for induction program then you reach the after three to two, cycles, two to three cycles. Then with the same imaging modality, take the patient for chemo radiation. And there is no stage four. The stage four B in carcinoma nasopharynx is distant metastasis. And there is no stage four C in carcinoma nasopharynx. There is no stage four A, B, or C in P16 positive HPV positive oropharyngeal carcinoma. It is no subclassification. Stage four means distant metastasis in P16 positive carcinoma oropharynx. Whereas in nasopharynx, there is stage 4A and 4B is there. There is no stage 4C. 4A is T4 or N3. Stage 4B is distant metastasis. Now, when we take the oleums for nodes, this, what you see in CT scan is the gross tumor oleum. And when you give margin, that's the clinical target oleum. That's around 0.5 centimeters or 5 mm. When you have an extra capsular extension, it should be one centimeter. So this should be the, 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 the CTV and one means GTV node plus pi mm. If no extra capsular extension at the level of the level, this is a level two node. Now, then you have a CTV N2 that involves the Ipsila region. This is the level two region. So this is, uh, this is the level two, so that's CTV N2. Then you put another PTV based on your initiative. Coming to more advanced nodal states, that is, suppose if you have a large pixel node with ulceration, if it, the patient is not, if it is common cell carcinoma and it is not nasopharynx or P16 positive oropharynx, generally one option is to consider them for palliation. And in this patient, you can see the lesion is involving the valicula. Can you make out a lesion there? And it's also extending in the posterior pharyngeal wall. And this patient is N3 because of three factors. One, skin involvement. Number two, the involvement of the sternocleidomastoid. And third is the encasement of the carotid artery. So this patient is in it. If this patient is in oro, if uh, in squamosal carcinoma of the head and neck, in head, squamosal carcinoma of the head and neck, you can see it is squamosal carcinoma of the head and neck, it is N3P. In P16 positive, it is N3, and it is stage three disease. Whereas in 
nasopharyngeal carcinoma, N3, no subclassification for N3A or N3B, it begins to stage 4. So the N3, it is any node more than 6 centimeters, either it can be stage 4B or stage 3 or stage 4A based on size. In P16 positive oropharynx, it is stage 3. In nasopharynx, it is stage 4. I have some message, okay, just, just let me check. Uh, if, uh, uh, okay, uh, there is some questions are there. I will take up, I will take up, I will take up uh, at the end. Yes, this is mainly regarding the, uh, the contouring part, I will take up. Then this, if the patient is having extra capsular extension, then you have to take one centimeter. So this is a extra capsular extension. Patient is involving the stranocleida mastoid and you have to give one centimeter, that is your CTB and one of the idols region. Well, now coming to the level three lymphadenopathy. So I, have, I was discussing about few clinical scenarios in level two. Then level two is 60 year old male presents with multiple level two and level three nodes. And you have to always think about uh, other possibilities which you have already discussed. And whenever you have only level three node, you have to think about more of a, more of a hyperpharyngeal spinal. If you have isolated level three, or you think more of a hyperpharyngeal spinal. So here, here, uh, can you mute, please? Can you mute? Can you mute? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. The, this is 65-year-old gentleman who is a smoker and alcoholic, presents, uh, presented with dysphagia and cervical lymphadenopathy. I'm sorry, this contrast is not good. You can see an enhancing, you can see a lesion. Actually, you cannot make out the enhancement there. In the right pyriform fossa, extending into the paraglottic fat, and also it is involving. So it is a it is a T2 because it is a pyriform fossa involving in the supraglottic larynx. T3, a pyriform fossa, three factors: one, tumor size more than four centimeter; two, ipsilateral hemilarynx fixity; three, if the lesion is involving cervical esophagus. If the lesion is between two to four centimeters or the tumor involving the larynx, then it becomes a tumor. And you can make out a node in the level three. How you make out it is a level three because I, the, you know that the caudal edge of level two is the caudal edge of the higher one. Once you see a thyroid cartilage, you see a thyroid cartilage, you see an arachnoid, this is an arachnoid, then you have to think about you are dealing with the level three. Node. When you have a cricoid, you have to think about it is level. When you see a trachea, the level of the trachea, it is level. So simple, if you are dealing with any nodal region at the level of hyoid, it is level two. It is anterior group. It can also in the posterior group, that's level five, I'll discuss later. Then it's a thyroid and cricoid level three and any node at the level of trachea. It is, if it is, it is level four at this region, okay. It can also be anterior group, it can be posterior group, that I, we will discuss later. Then this patient had, this patient standard treatment for a T2, this patient had actually had two nodes, at the level two also patient had nodes. So this patient was treated with concurrent chemo because standard treatment is to go for concurrent chemo And here you have a lesion involving left pyriform fossa, can you make out? This is the RA epiglottic fold on right side. Left side you can make, you cannot make out, the pyriform sinus tumor extending into the area epiglottic wall and just extending into the paraglottic fat, posterior pharyngeal wall, but prevertebral muscles are intact. So it's a T2 disease and multiple matted nodes involving infiltrating strand of the So it becomes an N3B disease. Stage 4B standard treatment for is to give concurrent hemorrhagation is the standard treatment. Here, a patient is having a very advanced disease. You can see a lesion in the left pyriform fossa involving the paraglottic fat, going posteriorly to posterior pharyngeal wall, prevertebral muscles are involved, and it also has an extra laryngeal spread. You can, you can make out a node here because it is having a different enhancement. So this is a node, it's not a primary enhancement. So this is a node at the level of level three because it's at the level of thyroid cartilage. So it is a T4B node, and it's a 65, and patient present with stride because the airway compromise is there. When this patient eventually underwent tracheostomy, then the patient was received palliative radiotherapy because it's a T4B disease, it's a stage 4B. Now coming to level three, 
there's the limits, you have seen that the caudal edge of the hyoid bone, that is the level two, and here it is the caudal edge of the tricotoid. So that is the superior and inferior extent of level three. The, this is the caudal edge of the hyoid bone and the caudal edge of the tricot cartilage. This is the tricot cartilage. You can see that this is the tricot cartilage, cartilage also, and below that, that's the trachea. So this is at this level, that becomes level three and level four. And that's the same level, you have the 5A and 5B convergent classification, that the subclassification that we will discuss when we discuss the level five. So the, the, the caudal edge of the tricot cartilage forms, forms the caudal limit of level three, as well as the caudal limit of 5A level four. And surgically, the caudal limit of level three is the homohyoid muscle junction with the internal jugular vein. That's a surgical muscle. And uh, we need to understand, this is the, uh, this I will discuss uh, this, uh, this is the thyroid cartilage. So if you have any node at this level, it is level three. This is the stenocleidomastoid. And you have the carotid artery here. This is the internal jugular vein. These are the anterior group, medial and posterior group of skeletus. This is the levator scapula muscle. And this is the trapezius. So any node you see between the stenocleidomastoid and trapezium that becomes the posterior cervical level. So this is a black space. This is the posterior, this is the level five or the posterior cervical node region, right? And when you have a node in this area, that is the, this is the thyrohyoid muscle. It extends into the anterior one third of thyrohyoid muscle. So if I contour, this will be the level three region. This will be my level three region. Are you with me? Yes, you got it. So this is the level three region. So this involves the medial border is formed by the medial edge of the carotid artery, the scalenous muscle, posteriorly to the posterior limit of the stenocleidomastoid, and uh, the, the lateral limit is formed by the medial edge of stenocleidomastoid, anterior it is the anterior limit of stenocleidomastoid, and also the anterior one third of the thyrohyoid muscle. So that is the uh, that is, sorry, the posterior one third of the thyroid muscle. So that is the uh, anterior level. So that is the boundaries of level three. So here, this is the anterior limit of the sternocleidomastoid, the posterior limit of sternocleidomastoid. Here you have the carotid artery. This is common carotid artery, there's a medial edge. Then this is the scalenous muscle. You can see more, this, this is the scalenous muscle. And also involving the posterior one third of thyroid muscle. This is thyroid muscle. This is the posterior one side of thyroid. That's the level three. Uh, I will skip this because that's how to get the CTV, CTV, okay. Now coming to the level five nodes. Level five nodes is again, they were level 5A, 5B, and 5C. It's, I have already mentioned that is C and nasopharynx, non-Hodgson's lymphoma. Rarely, if you have level three, bulky level two and level three nodes, you can have level five nodes from CA oropharynx and CA hypopharynx. So five, Sorry, 5A is the upper posterior triangle nodes, 5B is the lower posterior triangle nodes, and 5C is the lateral supraclavicular nodes. The 4B, that we will discuss later, it is forms the medial supraclavicular nodes. The lateral supraclavicular is called 5C, and the medial supraclavicular is called the 4. The clinically, the retroferent, the posterior cervical nodes, that's the level five nodes, rise extends from the caudal edge of the caudal edge of the hyoid bone that sorry the cranial limit of the hyoid bone i'm sorry the cranial limit of the hyoid bone to the level where there is a posterior that transfer cervical vessels that i will show you that is the that is that the nodal area between the heads of stenocleidomastoid and trapezius extends from the cranial limit of the hyoid bone to the, the level of the transfer so so 19 can you mute, please? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so this is the posterior cervical nodes. So you can see the posterior cervical node in a 19 year old boy, presents with a patient present with headache and also the posterior cervical nodes. The CT scan showed, you can see a destruction of the clivus. Can you make out? This is the clivus on the right side. Left side, there is a destruction of the clivus. And this is a, this is a T3, when the bone involvement in a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, base of skull involvement, penile sinus involvement, 
patient is having involvement of the paranasal sinuses, patient is having a clivus destruction or C1 vertebra, that is a T3 disease. So this patient is having a T3 disease and the patient is having nodes in level five. So this is the level five. We are discussing level five and the level five, the anterior limit of the level five is formed by the posterior limit of sternocleidomastoid. The posterior limit is formed by the trapezius. Medially, it is the scalenous muscle and also levator scapulae. Can you make out? This is the levator scapula muscle. Laterally, it is the skin and fat. Very simple. That is level five. And when you have, so the superior limit is formed by the cranial edge of the hyoid bone. You need to understand that the cranial edge of the hyoid bone is the inferior limit of the retropharyngeal nodes also, that is seminate. The inferior limit of the uh, uh, retropharyngeal nodes is cranial limit of the hyoid bone. That forms the, the superior limit or the cranial limit of the level five. Here you have the, this you can make out, this is the, this is the, you can make, this is the higher bone. So this is the superior limit of the higher bone. Forms the, cra the cranial limit forms the cranial limit of the uh, level five nodes. This we have already discussed. This is the inferior limit. That is at the level of the TT slice encompassing the transverse cervical vessel. That is the inferior limit of the level five nodes. This is the lateral limit. That is the skin and platysma. Adial limit is formed by the scalenous muscle. In the, in the inferior cuts, it may be levator scapula. Posterior, it is a trapezius. And here, it is the posterior limit of the uh, standard master. Now, uh, this, this is again divided into 5A and 5B. That is at the level of the caudal edge of the tricot cartilage. The caudal edge of the tricot cartilage forms the boundary between level 3 and level 4, and also between 5A and 5B. Now coming to level four nodes. Okay, this, I'm coming to this almost 47 minutes. Seven, four, so we have to wind up at 8 p.m. Now the level four is uh, the uh, level four extends from the caudal edge of the tricot cartilage to two centimeter above the sternoclavicular joint. This space is the level four. Node. That's the superior and inferior limit of level four. Level four is divided into four A and four B. That we will we will not discuss that because this forms because there is no time. The level four is nodes are usually seen a transglottic carcinoma. Suppose a patient is having transglottic carcinoma or an isolated subglottic carcinoma. That's very rare. Or the tumors arising in thyroid gland, cervical esophagus, or post thyroid. Level four lymph nodes. The level four, so this is the this is the anterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the posterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the thyroid gland. Uh, I'm, I know that this is not a good CT scan. This is the uh, the medial edge of the common carotid artery, and the the this is the scalenous muscle. So the anterior limit is formed by the anterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. Posterior is the posterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid. Medially, it is the it is the, is, this is the median. It is formed by the medial edge of the common carotid artery, the lateral edge of the thyroid gland, and also the scalenous muscle. And the lateral edge is formed by the medial edge of the sternocleidomastoid. This is level four. And this is, uh, if, suppose if you are taking 2.5, uh, that is 2.5 mm cuts, that is, then it becomes, then eight cuts above the sternoclavicular joint. That forms the level. Uh, that is the caudal limit of the level four lymph node. If you see any nodes at the level of level four from a carcinoma nasopharynx, then it becomes an entry node, irrespective of the size of the node. Then it, that becomes a stage four node. Because the level of involvement of nodes is one of the important factors that determine distant metastasis in carcinoma nasopharynx. This we have already discussed. Now coming to the last part, of uh, the nodal stations I want to discuss is the retropharyngeal lymph node. Retropharyngeal lymph nodes, it extends from the upper edge of C1 vertebra to the cranial edge, cranial limb, the cranial limit of the higher bone that I will discuss, that I have already told you. The inferior limit of the retropharyngeal nodes is same as the cranial limit of level five. That is the cranial limit of the higher bone. So this is for extends from earlier in 2013, in 2000, uh, to, sorry, 2003 publication, it was the, it was the base of skull. In 2013 update, 
the cranial limit have been uh, it is it is uh, the cranial limit as is the upper edge of sea level okay that is the uh, retropharyngeal nose so it extends from the c1 the cranial limit of c1 to the cranial limit of the hyoid bone so this is the the uh, level 7a retropharyngeal limit now, uh, where you have to search for retropharyngeal lymph nodes in your CT or MRI? So this is a, at the level of the, uh, this is at the level, this is a cut, axial cut in the cadaver, in at the level of the, at the level of nasopharynx. This is, no, this is the lateral pharyngeal recess from where the most common set of carcinoma nasopharynx. When we discuss some nasopharyngeal carcinoma that we can discuss all this, but I'm concerned about the retropharyngeal nodal area only today. This is the carotid sheath. In carotid sheath, the internal carotid artery lies more anteriorly and medially. The, the node, the jugular vein, more lies posteriorly and laterally. And there is also cervical sympathetic mass. The retropharyngeal nodes are seen at the anterior to the prevertebral muscle. The prevertebral muscles, this is the longest capitis muscle, this is the longest collagen, and lies medial to the internal carotid artery. So the lateral limit of the retropharyngeal nodes is formed by the internal carotid artery. And the anterior limit is formed over the fascia covering. This is a fascia covering the buccopharyngeal fascia that we will that I will show you. So this is the uh, fascia covering this. So you know that this is the pharyngeal constrictors. This is the pharyngeal constrictors. The anterior limit is the fascia covering the pharyngeal constrictors. And posteriorly, it is the prevertebral muscle. The lateral, it is the medial edge of the internal carotid artery. What is the median limit? This is not well defined actually, but it has been shown as it is, it has been shown, you draw a line parallel to the lateral edge of the longest capitis muscle. I still need to understand what exactly it is. Then the, there is the lateral retropharyngeal nodes and medial retropharyngeal lymph nodes has been, it is no more there in the picture. It is not clinically relevant. So whenever you discuss about retropharyngeal nodes, it is the lateral retropharyngeal. The lateral retropharyngeal lymph nodes lies between C1 to C3 vertebra. 75% of the nodes lies along with C1 vertebra, 18% along C2, and rest 7% along C3 vertebra. So it raises, it, it, it extends from upper edge of C1 vertebra to the to the uh, uh, to the the cranial edge of the body of the hyoid bone. From there down, uh, so this is the retropharyngeal nodes. Now we need to understand for uh, cervical lymph nodes, the, the size of the short axis diameter, the size beyond which you consider as clinically significant is one centimeter, whereas in retropharyngeal nodes, it is five, five mm or 0.5 cm. And the bilateral nodes, suppose you can see bilateral nodes in this particular patient, it lies medial to the internal carotid artery. And the bilateral nodes does not change the normal state. It is still M1, unless size is more than so the bilateral nodes will not change the state. And in carcinoma nasopharynx, this is retropharyngeal nodes are more seen in carcinoma nasopharynx. And we need to understand that in nasopharynx, retropharyngeal nodes are not the most commonly involved in this is level two. Most characteristic, most characteristic, characteristic lymph node in carcinoma nasopharynx is retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And you need to understand that there is no ipsilateral and contralateral business in the CNA separate. It is unilateral and bilateral. You can see a lesion here, and nodes are seen on the opposite side. Retropharyngeal nodes are seen on the other side. It is still, it is called the unilateral node. So it will not change. Suppose if we have primary on one side and nodes on opposite side, then in commercial carcinoma, oral cavity, oropharynx, it automatically becomes N2C. That will not occur in nasopharynx. It's still an N1. With primary is here, crossing the midline. You can see an enhancing lesion there, and which is mainly confined to nasopharynx. We do not make out any obliteration of parapharyngeal fat, prevertebral muscles, or pterygoid muscles. It may be a T1 disease. Here you have a node, so it becomes a T1, N1, the stage 2. You have node, nodes, retropharyngeal nodes, you have a level 2. But it is again multiple nodes on one side. In HPV positive COROPharynx, ipsilateral or contralateral business is there. But in nasopharyngeal carcinoma, it is unilateral or bilateral. 
it is a unilateral lesion. The primary may be on this side, but this is a unilateral lesion. And no nodes here. It becomes an N1 lesion. That is, so it is a minimum. If you have an N1 disease in nasopharynx, it becomes a stage two. In P16 positive disease, if you have an N1 disease, it becomes a stage, a stage one disease. Whereas in thomas of head and neck, it becomes a stage two. So this is how we could do for the uh, CN nasopharynx. You have a retropharyngeal nodes there. Then you give another 5 mm margin. So that becomes your CTV 66 or CTV 70, what you call it as. You have a enhancing lesion here. You encompass that also into that. So this will be CTV 66. You need not, you can, uh, you need not uh, involve the, you need not incorporate bone, you can edit from the bone. And this will be your CTV 66. Then you give a margin. You cannot edit the PT based on your institution protocol. So this will be your final PTV for the high risk period. Coming to a few clinical scenarios, uh, then we will wind up. I, I really want to take a few uh, questions. Uh, and uh, I know that there is another lecture I ate for 8.30 p.m. by Arvind Krishnamurti from Adaya. So if you may be interested to listen to that. Uh, we know that this in one pill, suppose you have 50, one, B, one disease. If you have a 50 year old male presents with one B node and smoker and alcohol, I have told you in the beginning, you need to consider the oral cavity, proper examination in the hidden sites, gingiobuccal, gingiobuccal sulcus, gingiolingual sulcus, under surface of the tongue. And you have to look into the, in, in the labial, labial mucosa. So you need to properly examine the superior inferior hidden sites to rule out any primary nodal cavity. Paranasal sinuses, external auditory canal also drains into the one villain. One, if you have a one end lymph node, this is a, suppose if you have level six nodes, anti jugular lymph nodes, it is divided into six A and six B, and we have no time to discuss all this. We will have another session to discuss that all. So, this is a, from the caudal edge of the hyoid bone to sternum, that is six A. This is six. The inferior limit remains the same, but the six A nodes, that is, forms the anterior jugular vein, and the jugular, sorry, anterior jugular nodes. That is from the caudal edge of the thyroid bone. And 6B, that is the from the caudal edge of the thyroid to the sternum. So this is the in the superior limit is different. 6A is called anterior jugular node that arises from the caudal edge of the thyroid to sternum. 6B, it extends from the cranial, that is the caudal edge of the thyroid cartilage. The only this is only one landmark that forms the uh, that is the caudal edge of the thyroid to sternum. This is 6B and this is 6A. So mainly it extends from the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the anterior jugular nodes. Then, so this is mainly from the lip. You have, suppose if you have a, any tumor here, multiple nodes are there, extra capsule spread are there, then you can extend into 6A, that is tip of tongue, floor of mouth, or tumors from the subglottic tumors, thyroid gland. This is a the main, uh, main six lymph nodes, that's the thyroid gland or cervical esophagus. These are the sites from there, the nodes are draining in the six or six feet. In one A node, this I also have discussed between the two heads of the anterior of the digaster. Uh, this is mainly drains from chin, lower lip, anterior floor of mouth, tip of the tongue, then mandibular incisors. This all three can train in the one A. This forms one. Then we will take few clinical scenarios. This we have already discussed. This is a recap. And all, uh, what we have discussed so far, 73-year-old gentleman presents with multiple lymph nodes involving both sides of the neck. Waxing and waning of symptoms are present. Slow progression of symptoms involving, uh, uh, evolving over a period of a span of two to three years. And you have to think more of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 15-year-old boy presents with multiple lymph nodes involving both sides of the neck. Short history. Hepatosplenomegaly, high counts, like 50,000, mediastinal widening in X-ray. Clinical examination shows hepatosplenomegaly. You are dealing with, is a adolescent male. You can, you have to consider more of a lymphoblastic lymphoma. Seven-year-old boy, you know everyone knows it is ALL, okay? 50-year-old male presents with the right ACF node, the lung, the esophagus. Also, you should think about the lymphomas. You should not forget about lymphomas. And in this 
ptt role female right scf we have discussed already he a breast he a lung he is esophagus non hodgkin's lymphoma hodgkin's disease 59 year old female presents with left scf node she a breast he a lung then you have to think about all the sites of uh, the gastrointestinal system uh, you have to think about carcinoma cervix that i have already told you all this patient should have a clinical breast examination and examination of the uh, you have to do a vaginal examination to rule out any uh, lesions in the cervix 52 year old male presents with left scf node he a lung git never forget about prostate 20 year old male presents with left scf node it is mainly a testicular jamsel tumor it is you immediately have to palpate the scrotum and also any you need to send the markers most probably you will be dealing with an non seminomic prostate this we have discussed 70 year old male habituated for smoking for the last 40 years presents with right scf node and persists with cough for three months duration and you have to evaluate and you have to look for clubbing you have to do an fnac you have to do a ct thorax never do a endoscopy first sorry nasal endoscopy or evaluation of larynx first most probably this patient will have a ct along 15 year old girl presents with right sided level 2 3 4 nodes no host with hosts no b symptom you have to think about ct thyroid 35 year old male presents with left scf node 3 3 into 2 cm 35 year old male presents with left scf node this is seminoma you have to rule out you have to examine the testes again this is the age at which you will come across seminoma so uh, the purpose of my talk was to know the radiological anatomy of the few uh, lymph node stations it is not possible to discuss all stations like retrostyloid 1a 1b 6x6b everything in one class but you need to when you clinically approach the problem you should know when to do an fnac when to do an excess by the lymph node and when to do a bone marrow aspiration and when to do a nasal endoscopy if a patient is having smoker alcoholic you the oral examination is not showing any obvious primary you can do an fnac followed by you can do a nasal endoscopy uh you can evaluate the oropharynx larynx hypopharynx if you have generalized lymphadenopathy or b symptoms or you do not have any symptoms pertaining to any subsite in head and neck region you have to do an excess by the lymph node when you have a short history bleeding manifestations if the patient is sick toxic in possessive infection is present then you think about all then you have to do a bone marrow aspiration and never wait to do a nasal endoscopy or excess by the lymph node to have a uh, you have to have a diagnosis of ail we will be losing very precious time in diagnosis and when you have a symptom suggestive any primary you evaluate with uh, endoscopy and take a biopsy in primary site then nodal staging you can see that if you if it is a hpv negative co oropharynx that is oral cavity larynx or hypopharynx if you have multiple nodes on one side and if none of them are more than 6 cm it is n2 and it is stage 4 in p16 possible if none of them are more than 6 cm it is only stage 1 we have multiple nodes sometimes it may this is 3 into 4 this is 4 into 3 this is 5 into 4 it's 2 into 1 it is even involving supraglobular fossa it is level 4 region it is stage 1 but if we have nodes below the caudal edge of the tricot cartilage in nasal pharynx it becomes n3 disease the respect of the size it becomes stage 4 in hpv negative co the pharynx we have bilateral nodes it becomes n2 c if we have a p16 positive tumor it becomes n2 and minimum stage is stage 3 in nasal pharynx bilateral nodes minimum stage is level is n2 minimum stage is stage of course if we have e1 n2 in nasal pharynx it becomes stage 3 okay i urge all of you to read this four papers one that is the ct based delineation of lymph node region that published all published in green journal published in 2003 update in 2013 and there is a proposal for delineation of oral ct be not post in post operative neck uh, in 2006 and the latest update of selection of lymph node target volumes in 2019 thank you very much for your patient listening uh, i will try to answer the uh, the questions 
that I got through the chat, please uh, keep mute. Otherwise, if everyone start, uh, Uh, if a patient is having intracranial extension, should the intention of treatment still be curative? Yes. In carcinoma nasopharynx, if you go to the guidelines, you can see that even if the patient is having distal metastasis, the one option is to consider that patient for radical approach. I will give you a clinical scenario. Intracranial extension is not distal metastasis. We know that there are a lot of limitations in giving radiotherapy, especially in the cavernous area because the patient is having a very close proximity to optic nerve, optic chiasma, then glow, and also the brain stem, and also the, the, region, the, the nodes to the, uh, the lens. You have all issues, but still you give induction program, then you reduce, then you discuss with the patient regarding, you may not be able to 66 or 70 degree to the, inter, the uh, intracranial part, you give induction chemotherapy, shrink down, then you discuss with the patient whether you are ready to have more toxicity or less tumor control, then you delineate, never leave the patient for palliation. Okay, it is still curative. Hello. Yes, yes. Can you mute please? Uh, if the... Okay, if the 5 mm expansion is extending into parotid, can it be edited? Okay, you need to, if you have a node, you need to give priority for node. If you look into the priority, various priorities that published very recently in Red Journal, they have shown that the parotid priority is down in the list. So you need to try to have a good local control rather than, a, rather than trying to save the parotid. I'm not saying that the parotid should not be saved, but it is better not to edit if it is extending into the parotid. You may reduce the intermediate risk volume or the low risk volume, but what is the evidence for see a nasopha, uh, carcinoma nasopha, uh, NACT in carcinoma nasopharynx? That's a very good question. Uh, there are six randomized, phase three randomized trials addressing this problem, comparing induction chemotherapy basis, chemoradiation, Induction chemo followed by chemo radiation basis concurrent chemo radiation. There are six randomized clinical trials. It has found that uh, those patients who have patient received uh, induction chemotherapy had a better uh, outcome in terms of reduction in distant metastasis and also improvement in, in, in uh, disease-free survival, also in overall survival. Also, although in majority of the clinical trials, there was no benefit in terms of uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, in terms of local regional control, the main concern is that there are some problematic cases like T4 or patient is having basal skull involvement, patient who have large bulky entry disease. So there was another meta -analysis. So there, all the data is from China or from Hong Kong or from Singapore. Uh, if you are interested, you can read because from 2016 onwards. And the, in the last ASCO, not, not this year ASCO, in 2019 ASCO, there was two updates of the induction chemotherapy trials and two, one new uh, abstract was presented. And uh, in 2019 itself, there was three phase three trials were published comparing induction chemotherapy basis, uh, induction chemo followed by chemo radiation basis, concurrent chemo radiation. Uh, in, in, in a, in a Yes, very good question. In a oral cavity disease, if 1B is only involved, should we need to condor level 5? In, in, if you look into the nodal involvement from uh, oral cavity to level 5, it's around 0 to 4 percent. So unless you have uh, level 2B node involvement or level 2 node, it's very unlikely to have a level 5 involvement from oral cavity. So even if you discuss about this neck dissection, Many of uh, the surgical colleagues believe that level five need not be dissected. You can get up with an extended supra higher from level one to level four because level five involvement is very rare in the oral cavity. So you need not cover level five in a patient with oral cavity. 
yes, uh, do you place, uh, of course, in, if you need to have a good coverage in the skin, preferably you try to give induction chemo program, then you reduce, then you adopt, then you do an IGRP, okay? Uh, of course, you need to, still you need to have a bonus. We need to, if you are, we, since we are using a six semi-photon, you have to, for IMRT, then definitely you need to have a one centimeter bolus for a file planning radio therapy. Yeah, in case of level oropharyngeal carcinoma, generally you can argue that the 5A need not be covered. It depends on many factors. Suppose the primary is T3, T4, patient is having a bulky level two nodes, definitely you need to consider the phone group 5A. Whether you need to have, if you have no nodes, you need to have 5B node, but you need to have 5B, you can give 50 gray, prophylactic dose, 54 gray, 52, 54 gray, prophylactic dose. Again, there are, People, you disagree to that. There is no need to do that. Okay, that there is no need to give sixty or sixty six level five. CTV need to be cropped. Okay, CTV generally need not to be cropped. Is one is. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your uh, patient listening. I sincerely appreciate that. And this is my uh, mail ID and this is my WhatsApp. If you have any questions regarding this or if you want to have this PPT, I can get mail you. Uh, I have one more question. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So shall we wind up? Yes, sir. thank you, sir. We are grateful for your patient's time you've given. It was a very informative presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yes.